that. I think since this is the last presentation, we needed that uh, entertainment. Uh, so thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Matt Kell. I work for the Research Institute of Sweden, RICE. Uh, I'm excited to be here amongst the hip hop family. And I'm also excited to talk about my favorite subject, hip hops. What else can I ask? Um, so I wanted to start uh, by setting the scene. Uh, by setting the scene to, uh, to show how our research uh, fits in with the bigger picture. Um, uh, uh, as we all know, uh, we're approaching um, a decisive moment in, uh, for the international uh, efforts to tackle our climate change. And as I see it, uh, according to the uh, uh, great challenge of, uh, uh, of our times. And uh, daily, we hear a number of countries pledging to, uh, to reach the target by mid-century, continues to grow, uh, but so does the global, uh, 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 the global uh, greenhouse gas emission. Um, so, uh, one uh, particular uh, technology which is growing rapidly is our beloved uh, heat pump technology. And uh, according to a recent publication by the IEA, uh, the uh, Net Zero by 2050 uh, roadmap, it clearly shows that uh, the heat pumping technology has been identified as the main heat technology to help us to, uh, to, uh, to meet our target to uh, 2050. And I've taken these two, uh, or these two figures have been taken from, uh, from that document to the top. Uh, figure is, is, is showing the challenge that we have ahead in a way that we are going to need around 1.8 billion heat pumps to deploy between now and 2050. And around 55% of the heating uh, 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 needs for our building should be done by, uh, by heat pumps. So that's one uh, big challenge in front of us. But at the same time, the, 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 the document also shows that deploying the technologies on their own may not help, uh, uh, may not be enough. So we uh, also need to look at energy efficiency and optimization of control, which would also uh, uh, help us to, um, uh, uh, to reduce our carbon emissions. And the bottom uh, figure uh, shows that by uh, looking at optimization of control, we are able to um, uh, smart controls can enable efficiency gains that reduce emissions for the buildings by around 350 megatons uh, of CO2 by 2050. And that's how our study uh, fits in with the theme of control optimization. Um, so what we've, uh, we've done is a, a, a story related to um, a research which I was related, which, which I was involved as a uh, PhD supervision uh, in the UK, and it's uh, a building that we had at London South Bank University called K2, and the eighth floor of the K2 is called Sarah Center, Center for Efficient Renewable Energy and Buildings, and it's a showcase for different low carbon technologies, including fiber optics, PV, solar hot water systems, PCMs, and ground source heat pump system. And this building was opened few uh, years ago by the former Prime Minister, as you can see. And amongst all this low carbon technology is the ground source heat pump system, which we will look at, and the different uh, scenarios that we've looked at in order to optimize uh, the system. So um, we had a 500 kilowatt uh, um, ground source heat pump, 120 kilowatts of heating, and 125 kilowatts of cooling. And this ground source heat pump is aided by 159 energy piles or thermal piles. I'm sure most of us uh, know uh, uh, thermal piles or energy piles have dual functions. As much as they are part of the, the, the uh, building to serve as foundation of the building, but at the same time they are also used as a heat exchanger to either extract heat during uh, winter or reject heat uh, uh, in summer. So those 159 energy piles were um, instrumented by a thermocouple. So if you look at the 3D visualization of the thermopiles, 
the ones in uh, uh, highlighted in a different color here, seven of them. We had a thermal couple installed at three different levels, three meters, 14 meters, and 26 uh, meters. And that's purely to uh, monitor seasonal ground temperature variation and how that seasonal ground temperature variation could also uh, be related back into uh, the performance of the system. One, and then uh, uh, the second um, aim was to see the long-term impact of load shifting to the structure of the building. But of course, our, our today's talk is primarily looking at the, the ground temperature variation and how that relates back into the uh, performance of the, uh, of the system. So before we started, we had actually a uh, three years worth of ground temperature variation at three different levels, as you can see. Um, so that is showing the ground temp uh, temperature profile over the three years, and that uh, uh, that's, that, that uh, shows the rate of heat extraction and the rate of um, uh, heat rejection. So at the beginning of the heating season, um, we will start at a certain temperature and as, uh, as we go along um, uh, uh, in, in, in heating mode, the ground temperature varies to uh, a certain level. And as you can see, year on year, the uh, ground temperature profile varies. And for example, if we look at here, we had a very long heating season where the ground temperature reached around 2 degrees here. That you can try to uh, um, relate to the implications of the performance of the system. The ground temperature reached 2 degrees here. And at the same time, at the end of the summer, the ground temperature also reached between 20 to 20 to 23. And if you link that into the performance of the cooling uh, when the system is operating at the cooling uh, season. So one thing that I wanted to highlight here is uh, it is important to recognize that the ground is not an infinite energy source um, and that excessive heat extraction or heat rejection can lead to a significant, as we can see here, to a significant change in ground temperature. And therefore, uh, uh, it's important to somehow regulate the ground temperature to ensure that the system operates at its uh, optimal uh, level of performance. So, with that in mind, if you look at the initial um, schematics uh, or diagram of the system, we have the four heat pumps and uh, either uh, when you're operating in heating or cooling, you will circulate the, the, the fluid around the ground to either extract or reject the heat. But one thing that I haven't spoken so far is as part of the ground source heat pump system, we had a dry air cooler installed. But one interesting fact about the, this dry air cooler it was designed to only come on or operate where the outside air temperature reached 35 degrees C. And I can see a few people from the UK that outside air temperature of 35 is rarely achieved or hardly achieved. So over the years that I spent at London South Bank University, I hardly seen the dry air cooler uh, run. Um, so although it's there to protect the system from operating uh, 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 from operating outside its safety model, but it hardly runs. So we started a discussion, as you would, being a researcher, to say, okay, so why don't we use a dry air cooler to um, optimize the system tactically, rather than just to uh, protect the system. And it, 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 as I said, it never uh, uh, runs. So we can use a dry air cooler uh, instead of bypassing the dry air cooler, we can circulate the, the fluid, depending on the different set points, to circulate the, the, the fluid via the dry air cooler in order to regulate the ground uh, temperature variation. So we, I'm talking about during summer season. So that's where the discussion started. So we've de developed a transit model. Um, to replicate the actual ground, uh, ground sourcing pump system with the ground sourcing pump system here, the dry air cooler, and based on the set points which I will talk about in a minute, you either go through the dry air cooler to, to get to the ground heat exchanger or you bypass the dry air cooler to directly reach through the ground heat exchanger. Um, this is some of the, uh, this are some of the list of 
inputs and assumptions that we've, uh, we've looked at. Since uh, it's a university building, uh, occupancy period was assumed around 13 hours, um, except weekends, of course. And that we had uh, uh, historical data in terms of the flow return, fuel temperatures, the heating and cooling performance of the system, and uh, the heat pump would operate in heating mode when the outside air temperature is above 18 degrees C for a minimum of one hour, and the heat pump would operate um, in cooling mode when the outside air temperature is less than 14 degrees C for a minimum uh, 14 degrees C. So we've looked at five different control scenarios, if scenarios to say, okay, what happened if we control uh, the dryer cooler to bring the dryer cooler on or off based on, um, uh, so of course for this talk, I'm only going to go through the two control strategies, but we've looked at five different control strategies. So the first one is to, to control the dryer cooler on uh, when the fluid temperature exiting the heat pump is greater than a certain temperature. So we looked at temperatures between 22 to 28, and that is you either pa uh, uh, pass through the dryer cooler or you bypass the uh, dryer cooler to get to the ground temperature based on those uh, 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 between 22 to 28 at increments of 2 degrees C. And the second control strategy looks at uh, rather than controlling the dryer cooler on or off based on the uh, exit from the, um, uh, from, from the heat pump, what about if we control it based on the, the leaving temperature from the ground? So we've looked at again uh, temperatures between 18 to 24, um, and 18 to 24 if we look at the historical ground temperature variation that I've, I've, I've shown, is within the uh, range of uh, temperature that we've, uh, we've looked at. So, then we've formed a number of scenarios. Okay, what is the impact of turning the dryer, the dryer cooler or the duct on or off, based on uh, based on, on on those temperatures in terms of the overall performance of the system, in terms of the energy input to the system, and in terms of the ground temperature, uh, how um, um, to what extent are we able to regulate the uh, ground te uh, ground temperature variation. And if we look at this uh, few uh, results, um, that's first is the effect of the dry cooler on the COP. Uh, and now we're talking about, of course, only the cooling uh, COP. And it varies between around uh, 6.2 all the way to uh, around 5.1 based on the, uh, compared to the uh, normal um, performing COP. Uh, and between 22 to 28, of course, as, we, as you would expect. As you would expect, um, during cooling, you would expect to have a, uh, to have a higher COP at a lower uh, uh, ground temperature, because then you, you're able to uh, reject more heat. And then if you look at the, um, the effect of the duck on the ground temperature, how, uh, 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 to what extent are we able to regulate the, the the ground temperature, so the normal uh, goes between 23 and uh, based on the uh, uh, turning the dryer cooler on or off, we are able to reduce the ground temperature to around uh, 20 degrees C. And finally, uh, if you look at the energy input savings, COP improvements and the ground temperature uh, reduction, uh, we were able, by looking at the, the second control strategy, uh, we were able to reduce around 21, 22 sense your improvements and if you look at the uh, ground temperature uh, uh, variation we were able to regulate or reduce the ground temperature by around 15% using the control strategy too. And to conclude, um, so the findings have an important implications for the use of the, uh, of the ground source heat pump system in various settings and we are able to show that uh, uh, not every system would have a dryer cooler installed on them, but if you do have, then we can use that to, um, uh, to selectively uh, produce more favorable heat sink temperatures and therefore uh, higher uh, COP compared to those generated by the ground sink. And uh, it also highlights for the study of 
the study also highlights the important importance of re regulating the ground uh, temperature for the optimal performance of the uh, ground source in our system. So that's where I'm going to uh, stop. Thank you for uh, listening. Keeping the time perfectly, as all the others, and so the paper is open for discussion. Hello, it's Michael Laugen from ANT. I have one question, I think it was on slide number four, yeah. where you give performance figures. There was heating capacity and cooling capacity. And maybe I missed one, but number four? Not four, but okay. four. Yeah. Really? Yeah. It says 120 kilowatt heating and 125 kilowatt cooling. Yeah. But that, is that the demand or is that the heat pump? Is that sort of uh, passive cooling water? Because usually no, I that's expect. Passive, that's, that's, so we have four of them. So each of them has a capacity of the okay. of the actual cooling. Okay, okay. You? Maybe I missed it, but in your calculation of your CBP improvements, consider the energy associated with using the tank? Uh, now, this is primarily looking at SPF C1, if you like, but of course with the inclusion of the energy inputs of the circulation model, the figures that I showed will go down.
to uh, take discussions later. Yeah. So thank you again. Thank you. <laughs>